I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome the uh, Black British Ballet Project to Liverpool. Um, this is Dr. Sandy Bourne, um, and she's going to tell you about the project, um, the work that they've been doing, and we have um, Vincent and Taylor performing tonight, and Sandy will tell you more about that. Thank you. Hello, good evening everybody. Thank you for coming out and seeing us today. Um, I'd just like to introduce, this is Black British Ballet, and today we're going to have one of our uh, dancers, who is Vincent Hantan, and he's had 16 and a half years. He trained, he trained at the Royal Ballet and six and a half years at the Scottish Ballet, and he's taught all around the world. So he's going to perform um, Stay, Steal Away and Pray. So we'd like to introduce Vincent. go away now. It's, <laughs> it's going to take a little too long. Um, when I do that piece now, I think of my brother, because I lost him about a month ago. And um, we weren't really brothers. We never got on. I don't know why. I was supposed to have gone back to Cape Town December of this year, last year. And because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel. And then hearing the, the news about my brother just it disturbed the equilibrium I had and the expectations. It didn't work out. 
But here I think about my brother. Can you talk about the piece? Perhaps you choreographed it. Uh, what was the meaning? Behind? The piece was choreographed by a young man. Well, he was young at the time, Jim Hasty. He was the artistic director of MMM, Margaret Morris Movement. It's an unknown piece of ballet that very few people have heard of, but it's, look it up, Google it, MMM, Margaret Morris Movement. It's a wonderful feeling, just wonderful. Um, if I can still do it, anybody else can. Uh, yeah, he choreographed it, and he re choreographed it on me on 2010. That's when I first got introduced to MMM, and I love doing MMM. It's not all walking, I can assure you. Once you get to the, the highest color, which is green, you have to audition to join the magenta class, which is an extension of, if you like, a professional ballet class. But you only get invited to that, which is wonderful. And the story behind the piece? The story behind the piece was Jim Hasty used to live with his mother until he was a grown man. Uh, he didn't want to leave home because everything was done for him. He would arrive late back home. His dinner would always be ready. His mother would always see that everything's done. He leaves first thing in the morning. The bed would be made up. And then when she passed away, he went, oh, I never said thank you. So he choreographed the speech to say thank you to her, which I thought was rather lovely. A bit late, but he did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Jim Hasty. And then he passed away. 2010, he was going to really teach me everything. He gave me all of his notebooks. And do you know what? I was hoping or banking on that there'd be little, I don't know, notation marks on the right-hand side of the margin. There was nothing. He had it all upstairs. <laughs> Bugger. Anyway, <laughs> I keep on praying for some more intervention. So would you like to talk about um, your, ex your inspiration to become a ballet dancer in South Africa? Oh. If any of you know about the apartheid situation, you'd understand, you'll know exactly why I left. Because um, in my position in South Africa at that time, 72, 73, I would never be able to sit on the same stage as someone else. Unforgivable. No way. And no way would I be able to speak to people of your color. I'd have to look down. But of course, me being me, I looked up and I always got... Always. And so I think of Glasgow, Scotland as my home, and I go and visit Cape Town. I've been there longer in Glasgow than I've been in Cape Town. So it is my home. But I have a soft spot for Cape Town. I really do. Yeah. And, and your first ballet class was it? My first ballet <laughs> class, if you can imagine, this 12-year-old, and I haven't grown much, but bare feet, shorts, T-shirt, and I looked through this window and this woman said, come, 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 come. And, I thought, and she came outside, grabbed me and said, hang on to the chair. There were a load of chairs on a diagonal in this hallway. And I had to do a ballet class. So I was there for a whole year. And she came to collect money <laughs> from my grandparents. My grandmother looked after me when I was six months old until 12 years old. So I always referred to her as my ma. Uh, I don't know if I was more embarrassed being hit by my grandmother or being hit in front of my teacher. But anyway, my grandmother took the walking stick, hooked me around the neck and clobbered me beautifully over the head. And my teacher said, that's okay, I understand. Um, I'll pay for everything. And she did for the past five years before I left. So I've been lucky. People have always been given me everything that I needed. So it's my turn to give back to everybody else and help them. And I'm not looking for brownie points, I can assure you. <laughs> so how did you end up at the Royal Ballet School? Oh, tricky question. Um, I want a scholarship to the Royal Ballet School or to the Legat School. I never heard of the Legat School, some Russian training I heard. Uh, but the Royal Ballet, everybody, heard of Nuria Fontaine, Sibley Dow, and of course that's where I wanted to go. Um, and this, this examiner, her name is uh, Miss Berry Berry, I'll never forget that surname. Uh, rather cumbersome lady, but um, she had a heart of gold and she gave me these tickets and she said, that's for you. And I said, oh, thank you, when am I going? She said, as soon as you want. <laughs> so I did, and I left in 1975 to the Royal Ballet School, and I never looked back. 
my teacher, Ivy Mae MacDonald, always told me I'll be a soloist. I didn't know what the hell that meant, but anyway, I'm a soloist. She believed in me. She said, you will not come back to this country until you get a British passport. And that's exactly what I did. So, so how was it at tra training at the Royal Ballet School? It was different. If any of you know the Royal Ballet School, I mean, they're all white, excuse me, but they really are very pale. And of course, I arrived. I was the only color one there. Uh, I was the center of attention. I didn't know whether I should hate it or like it. And I just went along with the flow. Everybody called me uh, Black Swan, Bournemouth Chocolate, yeah, Buana. <laughs> it was lovely, because in those days, if you were well off enough and you bought a washing machine or a tumble dryer, it usually arrived in a cardboard box. Uh, so they collected th th this box and said, go on, Buana, that's for you over there, you change in there. So for two years, I had to change inside the cardboard box. And just to be friends with them, I said, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> So what happened after you finished at the Royal Ballet School? Well, I finished the three-year course in, in two. Um, they wanted to get rid of me because I knew instantly I wasn't going to get into the company. The, uh, <laughs> the artistic director of the ballet school, Ms. Barbara Fuster, said, um, the company's full at the moment. Um, why don't you audition for Scottish Ballet? They were looking for six-foot-two dancers, not five-foot-six. Anyway, so I went along. Um, she said, you won't get in, but it will be good practice. So I did, and I got in. When I told her, she said, I don't believe you. So she called Peter Darrell and said, did you really get in? And he said, yes. And I never looked back. I was there for 16 and a half years. And if it wasn't for uh, two lovely South Africans um, who was in the Sadness Wells Royal Ballet Company at that time, they got me my work permit, David Blair and his wife, Marin Lane. If it wasn't for their intervention, I think I'd probably still be in Cape Town doing nothing. And what was it like at Scottish Ballet? Scottish Ballet, wow, that's different. You know when you move into a new, um, say if you're a student and you have to share a flat with six, seven other people, you have to fit in. And if you don't, you have nowhere else to go. So I had to fit in. And for the first week, I slept between the front room and the bathroom floor. <laughs> but I shared with uh, two Australians, two New Zealanders, and one Scots woman. Yeah, and me. It was interesting. My first party, they love to give parties. Um, one of those lovely cookies, and I demolished a whole plate. And um, people said, I, you should be careful with that. I said, why? What's in them? They're lovely. <laughs> well, I couldn't walk after that. <laughs> I found out the hard way. <laughs> so now I always ask, excuse me, what's in this? <laughs> yeah, but I had fun when I joined Scottish Ballet. And what sort of repertoire did you perform that you enjoyed? <gasps> um, when I first joined Scottish Ballet. We did what we called a pint and a pirouette. We danced in pubs up and down the country, Glasgow and Edinburgh. I loved it. If you were still alive when, um, what's it called, Jaws came out, that's when I started. <laughs> Jaws, a pint and a pirouette, wow, wonderful. And then afterwards, of course, box office grew and grew and people came to say, oh, there's a little black boy again. Oh, he's okay, isn't he? Yeah, and I can hear the comics on the stage. Some of them don't know how to whisper. <laughs> so, um, how about choreography, which is one of your uh, light piece, which piece is your favorite? My you favorite? That's a heavy loaded question. Okay, because all right, name two or three. Well, uh, yeah, they all diff different, but my favorite one is called Laisal Feed. It's about the poet who's after this stupid woman in a Scottish, and she's a fairy and he goes after her. Um, he's the only man with black top and white trousers, white sh shirt, white shoes. And I'm the only poet who's done the role with a half smile on their face. Everybody does it as if they came to their death's door. <laughs> and I thought that's rather boring. So when I did it, I went, this is quite nice. <laughs> I don't know why people don't like it. 
<laughs> because I always have fun when I'm on stage, even though when I'm nervous, I still try to have fun. But Lacelphedia. But the ballet that's closest to me and that got me noticed was Spectre de la Rose, uh, re choreographed and reproduced for Scottish ballet by John Gilpin. And it was a treat to be taught by him because he was the first one to perform that ballet with London Festival Ballet. And then he taught it to Scottish Ballet and me. And I still have all his letters and his cards and saying, now's your ballet, you can produce it for anyone. And I have, I've produced it in Cape Town, Ballet North Sea, um, New Zealand Ballet Company, Hong Kong Ballet Company. Wow. Yeah, so I love producing because I don't like changing. I don't like deviating from the step. If, if I had to do it in those days, you're gonna do it now. <laughs> And what's your least favorite performance or within the ballet company Ooh. that you had to perform? What's the least? The least yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Petrushka, choreographed by Oleg Vinigradov. He used to be the director of the Kirov Ballet Company, which is now the Mariinsky Theater. Uh, he came over with his wife. God, I hated that woman. She walked onto a floor like this, you know, special floor with stilettos, red stilettos, red tights red trousers, red top, red, 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 and a pint of Guinness. <laughs> 10 o'clock walking. And then we spent an hour at the bar and then she says, even Vincent Hampton can't do the steps. And I go, oh, this is too much for a black boy. And I just take my bag and walk out. So I didn't do her classes after that. And she was there unfortunately for three months. So for three months I did my own class. I must have been a pain to work with, you know? Because if I didn't like you, you would know. <laughs> I didn't say much. I would just keep my distance. And when did you start teaching? I started teaching on the very first day, kid you not. I saw this lady at the back of the class and I went, who's that old lady? And then someone afterwards said, oh, that's the ballerina of the company. I went, what? <laughs> just as well I kept quiet because she said, uh, she gave me a correction. I said, oh, by the way, when you do that next time, could you think taller? And she went, pardon? And she did it. And she went, you've got a good eye. I said, sorry, I must keep quiet. I just did why. She said, no, people never tell me these things. So from day one, I was given corrections when I should have kept quiet. <laughs> but I love teaching. I love helping other people. It's time. So tell us some of the places that you've visited through invitations to teach oh, around the world. Rather, where didn't I teach? Okay. Russia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Say no more. Yeah, I didn't go there, but I went all over North, South America, um, Europe, quite a lot. I love Europe. I really do. The training they have over there is so extensive. It's just another level higher. It is incredible. I teach, I teach babies here from the age of 12 to, if you like, 16. And they are really like babies. Yeah. Over there, they point you straight away. I go, hello. Yeah, I mean, they have a different mindset and they come prepared to do it. Yeah. Whereas here, you've got to say, oh, do you think we can get on now? <laughs> no, I mean, I, whenever I teach, and especially on the stage, and they do chasse pas de bourrée for the Puraway, you know exactly which country you're in, because forgive me, wherever I teach in the UK, they're very stingy when it comes to takeoff positions. They get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then they wonder why they can't jump or can't turn, because the takeoff positions is far too small for their length of leg. And each dancer or each person is different. So we have to give you a correction, give you a correction, give you a correction. We're all different. So that's why when I did the RAD training, oh, God help us again, RAD, <laughs> forgive me. I was there for uh, three months, and I wanted to kill someone every day. <laughs> I've already been teaching professionally, um, and they changed all of that. Uh, no, you must teach this way now. We speak this way when you're in the Royal Ballet. <laughs> and I went, excuse me? Is this a singing course or a ballet course? And the first stupid class we did was a contemporary class. I went, this is too much for a black boy. She laughed and that was the last time she laughed. They don't get my jokes at all. <laughs> but I thought I'd better, otherwise if I didn't, I would have killed her, really. Go back to performing. What was your highlights of performing? 
Just everything. everything. I mean, everything. I couldn't wait to get on stage. I loved it. There was a time where I would do a quarter ballet role and then a solo role and then a principal role all in one night because people would die like flies. And I loved it. Um, my partner, unfortunately, um, we were partners on stage together for 10 years. And she was the most unmusical person I've ever come across. Wow. Anyway, we seem to have had a chemistry on stage. So that's why we were together for so long. And I sometimes say, thank heavens I didn't kill her because that's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> and how about low lights low. Low, low points of performing yes well like I told you earlier mm. on about this Vinnie Gradov and mm. Petrushka he, mm. he did unfortunately if you're Russian and if you're a principal you only do principal roles soloists you only do solo roles but then they can elevate you to principal status so me being a principal boom, I got chosen to do it I didn't want to do it but I was done to do it. And then this other boy from Australia, fabulous dancer in the air. God, I could have killed him as well. I like killing people who's better than me. But amazing positions in the air, jumps like a gazelle, but lands like a bunch of crabs with no legs. And he never finishes steps, which just aggravates me. And every time I gave him a correction to better himself, he'd just say, use the F word and walk off. And I go, fine. And we shared a dressing room, unfortunately, for this program. But when I walked past him about six years ago, oh, it was as fat as thy kingdom come. And I had to go, what? <laughs> uh, double take. He works now for IT company. Very good with his brain where that's concerned. But for ballet, do you fall? Yeah. Yeah. But that was my low light. That was definitely my low light. <laughs> Okay, and what, what do you think about today about diversity in the ballet companies? I love it. I wish they had more diversity then. Yeah. Because if they had diversity then, I wouldn't be sitting here. I always yeah. wanted to be in the company with the Royal Ballet, always, always, always. But then when they said, oh, the company's full, I knew they were talking through their chasse part of the race. <laughs> so I just said, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. And if it wasn't for Peter Dow to take a chance on me, I think I probably would have gone back and done the teacher's degree in London again because he was my last hope. So good luck to him and thank you very much, Mr. Dow. And what message would you give to dancers, promising dancers? If you wake up in the morning and you feel like dancing, you have to be a ballet dancer. If you wake up singing in the morning, you have to sing. If you wake up playing <laughs> piano, you have to play piano. It's as simple as that. I wake up doing port bras and say, good, I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, think, I think you should follow your gut. Okay. Yeah. I'm good at giving advice, <laughs> you might have noticed. I'm not very good at taking it. Okay. Um, thank you for this. So I think, is it a good time to open up for the audience?